The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. This is Chris. It's uh, April the 2nd. Happy uh, end of the first quarter. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, too bad this thing wasn't uh, yesterday on April 1st. We could have really had some uh, some fun. I really had a big uh, April Fool's joke pulled on me yesterday. So I'm actually kind of glad it's, it's April the 2nd. So hope everyone's uh, doing well. Thank you for, for joining us today. And let's just go ahead and get started. And as a reminder, uh, with Kimball Charting Solutions, it's all about the power of the pattern. We believe that uh, price sends us uh, quality messages and repeating messages. But before I go on, I want to just kind of uh, get everyone's opinion, uh, and I'd like your opinion versus uh, email. I know um, when I go to look at a, a YouTube of some kind, and you know, we all see the uh, the meter about how long it is. Um, I don't know if you're you're like me, but when you see it's 50 minutes or an hour long, it, it's it's intimidating. Wondering, do I really want to watch it? Do I have that kind of time or not? And so <clears throat> I always find myself uh, uh, having mixed emotions as far as the length of uh, you know the Connect series webinars. There's always so much info to give, uh, despite you know there's times that I've gone an hour, hour and ten minutes. There's there's always more. Uh, there's always too much or, or whatever, but uh, I would like your feedback. And if you could send me a an email to the email address that you see on the screen at KimballChartingSolutions at gmail.com. And I'd just like your opinions on um, if there's anything that you like about the, the, the webinars that we do. If there's something that you'd like me to do differently, I'm all ears. I'd like your input on uh, the time of it. Uh, you know, would you rather that uh, I tried to make it a 15 minute uh, in, uh, webinar, maybe do it a couple of times a month versus a uh, one. Um, so I, I'm open to a lot of ideas. This is for all of you. I appreciate your uh, membership and I appreciate your feedback on this. So again, give me uh, some of your thoughts uh, again at Kimball Charting Solutions at gmail.com. I'd really appreciate it because I want these to be the uh, most effective for, you know, all of our customers. And so I appreciate you and so moving on, we always it's a, it's a reminder that at Kimball Charting Solutions, we're not bullish or bearish uh, on the markets. We are bullish on solutions and opportunities. Uh, I've just uh, rolled over into my 39th year in the business, and I believe the opportunities are just as great now, if not much better than than any time in the in the past with the kind of tools uh, that we have. So we go back to like a month or so ago, or the last couple of webinars. You know, I talked about that all of us could choose to be a fighter or a follower, and uh, that if, if you're, a, you're a fighter and you're going against the trend, you can be the guy on the left. It can be uh, pretty painful, and in my opinion, when we see just so many different uh, people's opinions on the markets uh, out there, you know, to me, it's always a reminder that, you know, the markets aren't wrong, just our positions are. You know, the market is always right. It is what it is. And uh, I don't try to get into the influences or, you know, a lot of people say, well, that, you know, the Fed's doing this or this. And so it's not really real. And I think it's just a waste of time. Let's just kind of use price patterns to to be. But I, I want to try to be open minded and always flexible. And I saw this piece in the lower right that's filling in on the, the Web this week. It just kind of caught my attention. It said a list of the top 10 people that got re rich being bearish all the time. And so that this is something that really is. Uh, um, I imagine a thorn in some people's sides as, as they fought the, you know, as we've just, uh, what, had 10 years off the 2009 low, and some, some people have just said this isn't possible, and they fought it all the way, and uh, I'm I'm not any smarter than anybody else, folks, but I, I, I am a, a follower that I'll just let price be what it is and not try to find the excuses of, of why things are doing, you know, what they are. So I, I want to remind you, to the best of all of our abilities, we all have biases, no matter what we try to uh, say that we do or we don't, you know, we are all biased in some certain ways, you know, but again, just try to keep an open mind and take advantage of the opportunities. And, you know, as we just ended a month, uh, we just ended a quarter, you know, this kind of thing sticks out to me that when we roll backwards two quarters to the end of September, this is a chart showing the excess 
uh, spread between indicators that show excess optimism and pessimism. And so uh, you can see at the end of the third quarter, uh, the, the indicator was relatively high. We all know how the fourth quarter panned out. And, and then, you know, around the Christmas time, you can see that, uh, boy, all these indicators, uh, the, the amount of excess optimism and pessimism, the spread had went from uh, excessive levels to uh, extreme levels on, on the flip side. And it was really easy to find uh, a lot of people um, bearish or upset about the markets, as, as you all know. Uh, I'm not going to split hairs on what is a bear market or what is not. But we all know markets were down heavy in the, the fourth quarter of last year. A lot of people cite that the S&P was down 19 point uh, something percent. So that was almost a bear market. Obviously, it was down, you know, quite a bit. But to me, these are, are opportunities of, of extremes. And so now we roll another 90 days forward and we look at this indicator and we've got uh, a, lot, a lot of optimism again in these indicators. Doesn't mean a tops in the market, but I just kind of this caught my attention that on a quarterly basis, you know, as you all know, we're doing these uh, webinars every month. But uh, just on a quarterly basis, we've really seen some extremes uh, the last three. And, and you know, it's, it's rare that that's happened. It, it, it is what it is. I don't know that it means much, but I, I do think uh, extremes become opportunities for us. That's why we have to remain open minded to uh, inflection points and, and trend changes. This past weekend, I sent a, uh, you know, in, in frequently, I, I send a coffee with Chris on weekends. Uh, I've sent a couple this year. If you'll remember a few months ago uh, on a Saturday, I sent one uh, reflecting that uh, the advanced decline lines were showing positive divergences. The advanced decline lines were trying to break above uh, last year's highs where the markets were far from that. And uh, to me, those were positive things. And so I don't send them very often, but please understand, it doesn't mean that they're going to be right. But when I do send them, I, I, some, something, in my opinion, that's rare or important has taken place. And so this past weekend, because we ended a month and a quarter, primarily that we ended the month, uh, a few a certain pattern, <clears throat> excuse me, caught my eye, and it was the doji star pattern. And you know, when we look at whether it's candlesticks, everyone, or it's uh, high-low closes, a doji star looks like in the upper left, and in, in a way, I tried to explain in the coffee report that it's kind of a boring pattern. You know, the notch on the left is the opening, and the notch on the right is the close, and typically, a doji star looks like a plus sign, and, uh, uh, you know, the ideal, I guess, would be is that the notch on the left and the right is exactly the same. Hardly any of them are exactly the same, but the closer they are, the closer it becomes looking like this pattern. And so again, uh, this is a plus sign that uh, when these take place on a longer term time frame, up against ideally resistance, they can really be a, a quality signal that maybe a trend is running its course, that the odds are increased that an inflection point is at hand. And so you know, from the Coffee with Chris report, I wanted to just go back to the, the Joe Friday chart that you see here, essentially at Thanksgiving. And uh, at Thanksgiving, I was making the point that in October, the month before, if you kind of look real closely in here, I know it's, it's small, everyone, but in that blue shaded area, there's your dozy, doji star plus sign. And, and this is in the 10, or excuse me, the five-year yield on a monthly basis. So two things caught my attention is that the five-year yield was facing, you know what, everyone, a 20-year resistance line. While it was up against that resistance line, this boring little quiet doji star uh, pattern took place. And uh, so this is what caught my eye. And then I drew the support line. And what it would reflect is if support broke, it would most likely reflect that an intermediate term high in whatever product it is, and this happens to be interest rates, was probably in place. So in other words, a high in yields was indicated by this doji star or a low in bond prices. So then if we move forward coming off of that, uh, here's an example of what interest rates did following that doji star pattern up against 25 year resistance. So the orange line is the 10 year yield. The black line is the 30 year yield. And you can see that the 10 year yield fell 17% through uh, this past week, and 
the 30-year yield fell 25%. And then this is a similar chart looking at yields, but it adds the S&P. And for those members that you haven't had to be around a long time, but I've tried to make the case for almost a year that with yields up against 25-year resistance, that my take was that if yields would soften with valuations and markets up against resistance, it would actually be a bad message to stocks. And so if you, you notice in the, uh, the blue oval in the lower right, as yields did fall hard, the stock market did uh, as well. And so to me, that the, the falling yields were an indicator of, of soft stock prices. And that's why we tried to have very low exposure going into the fourth quarter. And we were uh, blessed, lucky, fortunate, whatever, to pretty much skirt those uh, declines and then look for buying opportunities near the lows. And so <clears throat> this is something that caught my eye. And before we look at last month, let's just go back to the 2007 highs. We all know uh, that that was important in the S&P, but you'll notice that the 2007 high, a uh, doji star took place. And then we all know what happened at, uh, following 2007. Um, but there were very few um, doji stars that took place along the way. You know, this, this pattern is not perfect, folks, as far as there are times, you know, there's, there's always two sides to a coin. There are times that doji stars take place and they're not important or significant. You know, uh, one that jumps out to me is right before the, uh, the election of 2016 and before the big pop in 2017, there was a doji star at a high. You know, it drifted off for a couple of months and then it, it blew higher. So I, I want to cite that these things are not etched in stone, that by gosh, you know, they just a top has to be uh, in place. And, and that's not the case. But it's still my obligation to share with you uh, when these take place and, and how they could be taking place at important price points. So, you know, is it an oddity that last year's monthly closing high in the S&P essentially was a doji high in September? Well, probably not. And we know that it fell 20% after that. You know, the doji star last month is, is not as clean uh, as the one in September, but there's still a chance that it was a doji star. So, uh, like in, in time, like I've said before, <clears throat> if I wasted your, your time by sharing this and it ended up becoming a, a total bust and, and worthless, you know, personally, I don't care. It's, it's important that I empower you with it in case it does in time become something. So as we switch to uh, even a broader view, looking at the NYSE index, um, the NYSE, the, the broader this index is, or is broader than the S&P, of course, it looks a little different as far as uh, it continues to set lower highs since the January high. You know, as the S&P and a few markets hit new highs in the fall of last year, the NYSE, all it did was create a lower low compared to its January high. So this is even a little cleaner doji star in this broader based indice, folks, that this uh, doji star took place up against, uh, what, one year, essentially 12, 13 months uh, falling resistance. So the S&P wasn't the only one that made that type of a pattern. Uh, you know, every week in the global dashboards, we share, uh, I, I believe the, the DAX index can be important uh, to, <clears throat> to not only Europe, but send important messages here. There's a possibility that last year, over the last 18 months, uh, the DAX created a head and shoulders topping pattern. Again, this is a DAX on a monthly basis. There's a chance this red horizontal line is the neckline. And as it came up last month to essentially almost kiss the underside of this neckline, there's a chance that the DAX made a doji star reversal pattern. So as, as we sit back and, and look at these monthly patterns, there's several reversals or doji stars, obviously, that took place in key markets. There's another chance. I think it's a low odds situation, folks. Uh, but, you know, what if the S&P is making a head and shoulders top and this doji star took place at the right shoulder? Again, this is one of these, as you see in the yellow box down here at the right, low odds. Uh, high impact potential. I don't give uh, the odds really high that this is a head and shoulders topping pattern at this moment, but obviously if for some reason the market would start turning weak at this potential right shoulder following the doji star, all of a sudden we would revisit this because this pattern would become uh, all the more influential. So this is a, <clears throat> a chart that we've shared many times. 
Uh, it's the 10-year yield at the top, and I was just mentioning it earlier, and this is the S&P 500. But if you'll notice at the 2000 uh, highs uh, here on the left and the 2007 highs, they took place up against uh, falling resistance. Uh, and when yields uh, turned down, they turned down ahead of the stock market both times in 2000 and 2007. So this is a, we were just visiting the Doji Star and the five-year yield. This is a monthly chart. You can see that it uh, peaked up here uh, against long-term resistance. And now uh, yields are breaking below this potential sort support line while we have almost a, a trading range choppy flat market in the S&P 500. So um, if yields are a canary in a coal mine, they would say there's something concerning that, that's taking place. And I forgot to mention, but, you know, if we go back to that Joe Friday uh, chart on that Doji Star, folks, that took place in September. When did the Fed start acting concerned that they had raised rates too much and uh, they needed to lower rates? So think about that the Doji Star pattern was signaling that yields were peaking and bonds were bottoming before there was any evidence that the Fed felt like they had goofed up and they needed to reverse their their decisions. You know, and so again, um, the patterns were ahead of the action that was taken publicly by the Fed. <clears throat> the, in February of uh, 2018, a little bit over a year ago, we started, I started sharing that I felt like we could be entering into a trading range that could last months and months based upon some past patterns. And so this uh, four pack looks at the, the Dow, excuse me, the S&P in the upper left, the Dow in the upper right, uh, QQQ, the um, NASDAQ ETF, and Transportations uh, Index in the lower right. But I want to take your eyes back up to the, the top left chart. And we applied, as if you, your members, you've seen this over and over and over. Uh, I still think this is such an influential uh, piece to the market. We applied Fibonacci to the 2007 high, the financial crisis low in 2009. And you'll notice when the, the S&P came up and, and tagged the underside or faced the 161 extension level, uh, it, that's where it started a trading range. And that blue shade is close to two years uh, in length. And so, you know, in hindsight, what was that trading range, everyone? It was nothing more than an upper level base to push higher off of. And then you'll notice it's, I know it's hard to see, but uh, again, this is a monthly chart. It broke above it for a couple months, came back and then tested two year resistance as new support here. And then it rocketed 50% to higher in a year. So, um, this is why I started bringing up that I thought we could be in a trading range because so many markets were facing key Fibonacci extension levels to a degree uh, more than I had ever seen in my 39 year career. And it doesn't matter if you've just been doing this three or four years, we can all look backwards. It doesn't matter how long that I've been in it. We can all look back on history. And when I did and, and looked even beyond the, the time that I've been in this business, I've never uh, found a cluster of extension levels coming into play all at the same time based upon key emotional highs and lows. And that's why, uh, whether I went out on a limb or not, why I tried to start beating the drum that I really think, you know, we're going to get in this trading range and uh, there's going to be opportunities in it. You know, I felt like there was opportunities a year ago and I don't feel any different now, but it's, it, it makes you change your game a little bit. And that's what what I want to try to do is empower why uh, the mindset that you ought to have in the game that we're playing. So this is the performance, this wild chart. Uh, just hang with me here. This is the performance of many different indices since uh, we shared that we thought a trading range would take place. And so and this is a performance since last February. Just these initials on the right side. RSP is the equal weight uh, S&P. Uh, despite this uh, big rally that we've had in the first quarter, it's down 73 basis points. The Dow's down about 1%. Small caps are down 254. Mid caps are down 285. The transports are down 461. The New York Stock Exchange is down 5%. And when we go overseas, it, it's weaker. They were weaker on the downside, and the, the bounce back has not uh, had them catch up 
you know, as much either. IFA is down still 12% from last February and emerging markets down almost 15. So there's opportunities in all of this, but from a, a, a perspective of what to do with your monies, you know, we started advocating, uh, you know, a year ago, be careful with the amount of money you trade, trade uh, less frequently, trade smaller, and just beware of the, the chop, chop, chop that could take place. And then this really shows this is a pretty wild EKG, you know, with a, a lot of different zig, zigs and zags on it. But uh, again, if we continue to see this, there's still opportunities. So don't let a trading range, uh, because especially one of this magnitude, still provides a lot of opportunities. I want to remind you, because um, we're really, to me, at some important points uh, in, in the leading sector being tech. And so this is uh, looking at QQQ, the, the NASDAQ 100 ETF, on a monthly basis since its low in 2003. And then I compared it against the S&P 500. So, you know what, 2003, we're 16 years uh, on this chart. Uh, look at the performance spread between the S&P and tech. And uh, I, I know we just, uh, you know, we don't live 16 year blocks of time, but I just want to remind this really just shows how important and how much of a leadership that tech is. And we're going to dig into some tech charts. And this is why I want to just kind of share, you know, tech outproduced in the last 16 years, almost 3x what the S&P has done. So, you know what, uh, since, <clears throat> since the 2003, the S&P up 200 percent versus almost 650 on the Qs. So this is why I think uh, understanding that how important tech is and what is happening in tech and, and where some of its charts patterns are, could be telling us right now. So <clears throat> this is looking at QQEW, which is the equal weight uh, NASDAQ uh, ETF. And something quite positive uh, taking place here, which is a real rare duck that, you know, how many indices, everyone, if you, if you said how many are above last year's high, a lot of you are smarter than me, but I, I, I would struggle to find many that are and uh, or ETFs that are above last year's highs. And, and so there's some, but this is one that's you know, reflective of a uh, leading sector. And as of this week, the week is not over with, but you'll see in the green shaded circle that QQEW is attempting to break out to all time highs above last year's highs while the chart in the lower right, which is the NASDAQ 100 advanced decline line, is at all-time highs. So historically, uh, the breakout of, of prior highs and the advanced decline line at all-time highs has historically been a positive message for tech. And uh, as we know in the past, uh, if tech does well, oftentimes the broad market can too. So whether that second part is true, uh, right now there's some positive things coming from tech. So when we get out of the world of the equal weight and we look at the cap weight QQQ, uh, we've applied Fibonacci to the dot-com highs in 2000 in the top A on the left. In the bottom A on the, uh, on the right is the 2003 low, and uh, it is facing its 161 extension level of those huge extremes, you know, this was a 90% decline, everyone, in the Qs from the 2000 high to the 2003 low. And so it's it came up, if you'll notice, uh, last year to test and attempt to break out at one. And this is a monthly chart. And then there's a darn uh, hanging man pattern that we talked about several times last year that took place in the fall of last year right at, I mean, it was a fraction above. I, I don't know that it was even 2% above it, but when we're looking at 16-year uh, Fibonacci extension levels, that pretty much, that hanging man pattern took place right at the, uh, the Fib extension level itself. And so then, as we all know, into the fall of the year, it fell almost 20%. Well, now we're coming back to test those prior highs. So there's probably, what, two things that could happen here. Currently, we uh, it's Kissing the underside of it, we got a double uh, double top possibility in hand. But obviously, if it breaks above that, with the Qs breaking above and the advanced decline line in tech breaking to all-time highs, if it would break above this Fib extension level, folks, 
uh, you got to think that this will attract a lot more dollars, and that would be a very positive uh, price message. So uh, again, I'm, why I want to focus on this is uh, tech, which is the leadership, as we all know, is really at an important inflection price point that could be bullish for the broad market. So speaking of tech and key long-term price points, uh, another key uh, uh, sector, as we all know, is the semiconductor, the guts of the computers that we own, and you know the chip makers and different things. And so this is a chart that we uh, look at frequently. But again, this is really an important uh, price point, in my opinion. Uh, on the upper left of the chart at one was the 2000 highs. You know, you roll uh, the chart over here to 2018 last year. You'll notice it just kept banging and banging and banging up against that. It, it made several attempts to push above it. Then we had a, a quick uh, decline. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact percentage, but we all know it was at least 20. You know, that was a pretty sharp decline in that. And then here we got this run back. And so SMH is making a run, uh, an attempt to break above the 2018 highs and the 2000 highs of 19 years ago. So another uh, another thing I want you to keep your uh, close eye on, and I am, is how semiconductors do here because if the QQEW equal weight breaks out, QQQ uh, breaks above the 161 level, and semiconductors, if they would happen to break above the 2000 and 2018 highs, those would be three positive price messages from a very important sector being tech. So here's a little closer look. Uh, that, uh, the prior chart was semiconductors monthly. This is semiconductors weekly. So you can see where the, the highs took place in earlier of last year. A, a key level essentially is, is around 113. Um, obviously, obviously, it was a little bit uh, above it uh, at one point before it fell, fell or declined when selling took place into the spring and into the fall of last year. But this is just a little closer look at you know, if this can get closed solidly, probably above the 114, 115 level, uh, definitely that would uh, be a, a positive message from the important semiconductor ETF, SMH. Just a reminder, this is a advanced decline lines on the NASDAQ on the left, S&P on the right. The blue horizontal uh, levels are last year's or 2018 highs. And so even though the S&P is not above last year's highs, the Dow's not above last year's high, the Q's are not above last year's highs, uh, the mid caps are not above last year's highs, small caps are not above last year's highs, transportations are not above last year's highs, the advanced decline lines are. So in the past, from a historical perspective, uh, seeing these uh, at all-time highs uh, would say, suggest this is a bullish divergence that's taking place. So this is uh, historically not where uh, you see a lot of weakness in the markets taking place when you see the positive divergence from the AD lines. <clears throat> a good friend Ryan Dietrich uh, posted this and I thought it was an interesting chart. Um, so this, this looks at uh, the performance of February, um, March and April over many years, you know, over the since 1950 and uh, looked at uh, times when you had a, a really positive uh, first quarter. And, you know, the question was, what did the second quarter look like after a good first quarter? And so Ryan's synopsis on the right here is that April, Q2, the second quarter, and the rest of the year returns are all actually better than average when we have a strong first quarter that we just went through. And uh, he said that the final nine months of the year following a strong first quarter to the degree that we had was up 18 of 19 times. And the outlier was the 1987 year uh, that I, I remember oh so well as that was my uh, seventh year in the business and, and was quite a, uh, a memorable uh, time frame. So uh, the, the takeaway from this, you know, from Ryan is that uh, the average gain in April when the first quarter was as strong as 1.7 and the final nine months uh, net gain on average is 9.6. So <clears throat> to me, folks, there's a, a mixed bag of things going on. You know, the, the AD lines are, are positive. Uh, sentiments aren't crazy on some extremes, but there is 
uh, a lot more optimism than we obviously saw at uh, Christmas. Uh, dumb money is uh, was scared to death at Christmas. I think the dumb money indicator was at zero at Christmas. Now it's it's uh, back at the highs over the last year. So there is a you know a mixed things you know going on, but that uh, doesn't mean that there's you know lacking of opportunities. But just from a sentiment perspective, to kind of you know give you the idea, this is a smart money, dumb money, confidence spread. You know, here was uh, the end of the uh, the what the third quarter, the start of the of this, the first quarter of this year. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is where when it's down in this lower levels, what's oftentimes where markets are much closer to a high than a low. And I will excuse me say that these uh, these type of indicators are actually better at lows than they are at highs because highs can could take a while. I'm still a believer that uh, tops are more of a process and bottoms are typically more of an event. And so, uh, you know, we did have a, a V bottom or, around Christmas and then quite a rally. But you can see right now that uh, the smart money, dumb money spread is about where it was um, when we made mention uh, in last February that we thought we'd enter a trading range. And then on the flip side, the percentage of uh, indicators reflecting optimism versus pessimism spread. Uh, typically, when this is low, this is a similar a case that this in, these indicators or this indicator is much better at uh, suggesting uh, or being timely on bottoms than tops. Uh, you can see there was the, the low uh, at Christmas. There was the low uh, a, a year ago in April of 18. But um, here we are. Um, again at uh, extended levels, almost at the levels we're, we're, sh we're shy of January of last year and we're about at the same levels of the September you know highs. So we do see some extremes in both of these taking place. So you know last year uh, before the market sell off, I, I tried to highlight uh, to you, to all of you, uh, divergences that were taking place that were similar uh, to 2007 and to 2000 in several different sectors and talk about risk factors, what comes into play when, when that happens. And so I want to kind of in this next little section as we get closer to the end, uh, talk about some of these different uh, divergences that are, are still taking place and risk factors with valuations. And we all know that there's uh, lots of really good valuation tools. Um, no uh, one uh, valuation indicator to me is is the holy grail. Uh, this is not one of them, but it, it is one that I've I've watched uh, closely for I don't know 20 25 years, and it's the Buffett uh, indicator, which is just essentially taking the value of corporate equities and and dividing it by the economy. So there's nothing really fancier than that. It's not taking earnings and just all the other stuff that can go into some of the other calculations. It's just market value. How's the economy doing? And so one of the things I like about it, it it's, it's got some length to it. It's, you know, what, 65 uh, you know, years in length. It's got some t time behind it. And so just as far as perspective, I was fortunate to get into business in, in 1980, February of 1980. And you can see where the Buffett indicator was. And then it was a, a really a fun ride. Uh, you know, the Dow was 1,000. And you know, then, then it just took off through the, the 80s and the 90s. And so then uh, when you look back over the last 65 years, obviously 2000 was an extreme. And so uh, where are we now or where were we uh, a little closer in time? There was 10 years ago. There was the financial crisis low. Uh, you can see it was way off of uh, where it was in 2000. But currently we, we've come down some. Um, we are definitely uh, lower than the, the aberration of uh, 2000, uh, but even though it's come down, we're still above the 2007 levels. So uh, I just share this for perspective. Uh, this is a poor timing tool. I don't intend it for that, but I, I think we'd be um, unwise to almost be like the ostrich and stick our head in our sand and not try to be aware of where these really long-term valuation uh, ratios or indicators stand. So one of the things that uh, when we talk about divergences, um, we've you know I've shared uh, one of the ones that we've shared many times is uh, that junk bonds have diverged in a negative way, a bearish way, against the stock market for quite some period of time. But I actually want to make the 
enlighten you to a short-term positive divergence that's taken place in junk bonds of late. So the top chart looks at uh, junk bond fund uh, PHDAX, which is the PIMCO high yield fund. And, you know, hey, Chris, why do you show the, a mutual fund and junk bonds? Well, here's, I'm biased for a couple of reasons. One of them is I've watched this fund for uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, and one of the things that I like the best about it, it has a long-term track record, folks, that we can look at for long-term chart patterns. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, any of us watching J and K and HYG, I do, but this this is a rare duck in the junk world that we can really look at long-term patterns. But I'm gonna flip the table and actually just look at something really short-term, just as we started off this talk looking at the last two quarters, let's just highlight those two quarters, you know, again, this is the September high. And so, again, the top chart is junk bonds, the bottom is the S&P 500. Notice that both peaked at the same time at this pink vertical bar. And then what happened in December? Both bottomed at the same time. So there was a high degree of uh, turning point correlation. Obviously, prices vary between them. But here's something I haven't seen in a while. And it's actually, uh, in my take, it's a bullish divergence message from junk bonds is that uh, currently the junk bond fund, PHDAX, is uh, pushing ahead, making an attempt to break out above the September highs while the S&P is actually lagging below the September highs. So uh, don't haven't seen this much over, gosh, a lot of years, everyone. So but from a short term perspective, uh, to me, this is actually a positive message coming from uh, the junk bond arena. One of the uh, divergences that, uh, you know, th these these charts, the last chart was a divergence that we pointed out to last year in a bearish way. This is another divergence that we talked about, which is the Dow Jones Home Construction Index on top, the S&P on the bottom. When we went back to the 2007 highs, home construction started falling apart well before. I mean, a couple of, we're not talking weeks or months, we're talking years. It started falling apart years before the S&P did. But I'm not, I'm not telling you anything new that the, the housing sector and home construction is very important a component of, of our economy on a macro basis. And so we can't overlook potential messages that are coming from the housing sector. So when we look at patterns that took place then, you know, is that a head and shoulders top? It's potential, you know, in hindsight. But even forgetting that, you'll notice that there was a, a horizontal potentially support line that was broke. And then home builders came back up and kissed the underside. And then once they kissed this underside and failed the to get back above new resistance, they just fell apart. And uh, I know it's hard to tell folks, but you know where it was kissing this re resistance was in the 700 range, 750-ish, you know, or whatever. But if you look on this uh, table on the left, 500, 400, 300, 200, you don't even see 100 on there, you know. But going from just a 750 to 200 is a significant increase, and so. Uh, they, they really gave a tip off to trouble ahead. So now turn the page forward and I want you to look, kind of glance at this pattern, you know, lower highs, the break of potential support and kissing the underside. It kind of looks like this pattern. And history never repeats exactly. That's not my point, but sometimes it rhymes, folks, on a pattern basis. The bottom line is if you didn't see anything on the left of this chart, forget 2007 and what it meant. On this right side, home builders are kissing the underside of resistance for the first time in months after breaking support. And so this is an important kiss. And the oddity to me is it's the same price level where this happened in 2007. So could this just be noise? Yeah, it's all, it, it sure could be. It could be just meaningless. But keep this in mind that if you see home construction start drifting or selling off hard here it could be this is a place that the bullish case for upside breakouts does not want to see home construction fail here the bullish case would love to see a home construction succeed and break above the current kiss of resistance in the upper right you know there's a lot of things you know i, I doubt that any of you have lacked seeing 
some form of an economic report uh, around the world of something softening, you know, retail sales. I mean, you know, what comes to your mind? You know, just think about, you know, are we hearing growth or we're we hearing softening? You know, PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, you know, and this was one that uh, came out from Charles Schwab that caught my attention. You can see, holy cow, it's fallen apart on the right side. It's now back at the 2009 levels. So I, I, was, I want you to ask yourself this question uh, because I got asked this question from Sir John Templeton. I would express some concerns. I would express something like this. And Sir John would say, hey, well, this is accurate. This is happening. The thing that you have to ask yourself is what he would say is how many people around the world know this? Is this a surprise? Is this built into the market? You know, I've, I've never, you know, humbly been able to know is something built into the market. But, you know, I have seen in the last 39 years when something becomes really well known, the odds do increase, everyone, that it, it is built into the market. So on the surface, I don't think this is good news. Um, but I still have a big question is, is it built into the market? You know, because uh, I don't think this is really the case, but uh, when it was at this level, geez, the market was at lows in 2009. So that's why I said a lot of this, it's a mixed bag of stuff, everyone that's going on, but to, to not, you know, just uh, like I said, you can follow the trend or you can fight it. You know, we're going to see more of these different things coming out and, Obviously, Europe, you know, we continue to see stuff like this coming out that is, is soft. But here's one I want to share with you that I don't think I've ever shared on a, a premium webinar before is, you know, when we're looking at how well is the economy doing or not, you know, we, we just discussed uh, home builders. Why not look at concrete? You know, that's, is that an important part of, uh, you know, the big picture of, of building roads and parking lots and buildings and all kinds of things? I think it is. But this looks at uh, U.S. concrete, and the symbol is UCCR weekly. This is a long-term uh, chart based upon a weekly basis. And you can see since the 2012 lows that this stock has spent the majority of, what, the last seven years inside rising channel one. Now, it diverged negatively last year. And why do I say that is because while the market went to new highs in the fall, you can see that actually in the latter parts of 2017, this stock started falling. And from 80 to 40, this is kind of deceiving, folks, or even lower than that. I mean, it did fall more than 50%. That's a pretty big haircut. So, uh, but the support channel didn't break. You can see it's now made a series of uh, higher lows. And now it's up testing uh, the red line, which is old support, which is new resistance at two. So as everybody's trying to talk about economic indicators, you know, for different answers, here's a little canary that I, you know, I'd encourage you to pay close attention to. And um, it might send a, I mean, it'll send a good or bad macro message, in my opinion. But uh, if it would break above two, that'd be a positive. And if it, it keeps pushing higher, you know, there's probably going to be several uh, things, even some commodities, you know, that might do fairly well. But again, an important resistance test is taking place at two that from uh, concrete that uh, could send a really important message uh, to copper, uh, Freeport, McMoran, and several different uh, uh, macro sectors you know, that are out there. This is a reminder of, uh, you know, we've got a new month going on. I've been sharing this, you know, in the sectors report. Uh, this is the uh, top 20 stocks that have done well in the month of April over the last 10 years. And, and again, these are only S&P 500 stocks. And so you see the median return of uh, each of the Aprils over the last 10 years is 0.99 or about 1%. And on the list on the right, our criteria is that we're looking for S&P 500 stocks that have went up a minimum of 7 out of 10 or 70% of the time over the last 10 years. And so you can see uh, the list that's done well. Oftentimes, you know, at the top of this list, we folks, everybody, we see stocks with uh, 11 percent gains 12 15 16 uh, Amazon's at the top of this list it's averaged an eight percent median return over the last 10 years and then you can see other stocks uh, on the way so this is a, a mildly favorable uh, list a, a lot of times they're a lot stronger than this 
But the one thing I've been pointing out is when you look down here, uh, this year we started putting what sector these stocks are from. There's one industry that really jumps out a lot, and it's energy. You know, you see OXY, you just see several energy stocks uh, here, and we all know that uh, crude's doing fairly well. There's a high correlation uh, over the last uh, many months between crude and the stock market. And so as crude keeps uh, inching higher and the correlation still remains, um, the stock market will probably do well uh, with, with as well as crude oil is doing. So, you know, while we're discussing um, April stocks, you know, uh, I just wanted to kind of go back that sometimes we can get lucky and blessed on some of these stocks that are on the strong list. And uh, back in February, at the end of January, but uh, CDNS, Cadence Design, was on the February list of typically doing well in the month of February, and we picked it up. Well, this uh, table here is the, uh, what, the top 20 stocks, I apologize, 20 or 30 stocks that did the best, S&P stocks that did the best in the first quarter of 2019. Just to show you that we, you know, we got fortunate that, uh, uh, CDNS was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eighth best performing stock in the first 90, um, 90 days of the year, up 46%. So some, sometimes it's nice to get to, to get lucky. Um, so while we're on this theme, I want to share one of the stocks that's in the April seasonality um, list, which is Wynn Resorts, W-Y-N-N. This is Wynn on a weekly basis. You can see that Wynn got a heck of a haircut. It wasn't a winner uh, from the highs of last year when it was up uh, a little around 200 bucks, heading down below 100. So obviously it's a 50% haircut last year. Bearish divergence took place with the broad uh, market, uh, lost more than the broad market. Uh, but the, the rally off of the Christmas lows has a uh, win testing um, the top of this new falling channel and the horizontal blue line that both come into play as resistance. So I've got an alert set that if a wind breaks out above one, uh, I'm going to look to be a, an owner. And you can see in the gray box in the upper left that historically in the month of uh, April, when uh, has gained about 7%. And, you know, if I'd been a lot smarter, uh, everyone uh, would have bought this stock last week because, uh, what, the first day of April, uh, when had a big pop, you know, yesterday. I uh, obviously didn't catch it, um, but I'm, I'm interested in owning the stock if we see a dual breakout at one. So as we're just about ready to wrap up, something that really is catching my eye, remember earlier in the, uh, uh, the webinar, I talked about what indices... Uh, or sectors are looking at breaking above last year's highs. And so to me, an important one is uh, working on a an all-time high and a breakout, but it's not in the States. Obviously, we can own it in the States, but it's ETF EWH, which is the Hong Kong ETF. And so you'll notice this uh, horizontal line, which represents the highs of, of last year, um, Hong Kong, is testing the 2018 highs at, at one. The chart on the right is EWH versus the S&P. And you can see, this is the, the beginning of the year, that in the fall of the year, since the fall of the year, uh, this has been stronger than the S&P. EWH has uh, gained uh, well, and it's reflected relative strength against the S&P 500. So my take you know, here is, as we wrap things up, is uh, that this is an important area in Asia. Um, I'm not into the, if uh, the president can come up with a trade agreement, the stocks will do well or poorly, whether we will or we won't have a trade agreement. I, I'm not thinking about that all at all. It'll just be what it is, folks, but price, let's let price be our guide uh, I'm interested in owning EWH if it happens to break out to new all-time highs at uh, at one. So I want to just keep you alert that if it does, there's probably other areas in Asia. You know, a lot of people are talking about how poorly it's doing and on and on and on. on. Maybe it is. I, I don't know. But from a price perspective, 
this really has uh, has my interest, you know, by far. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, attending. And like I said, when I started out this webinar, I'd like your feedback on uh, the length. What's the ideal length of the of the webinars? If there is there something that you'd like me to do differently? What things do you like that you'd like to see more of? What do you dislike that's a waste of your time? Uh, again, I'm doing this for for everyone to to try to talk out some of these charts versus just sending them to you on the, on a weekly basis. So uh, as we start a new month, spring is is here. Uh, the weeds are greening up, you know, around here. Uh, I hope all of you have a, a great month. Uh, we appreciate your business greatly and uh, best wishes and we'll see you uh, a month from now. Thank you, everyone.